trying to make one currency in Europe. You see, it's something that you have to do sooner or later. And so, so that uh, so, so in, the, in the mature stages of development, uh, you you find that mutualism increases, and that increase in, in the older communities, things like mycorrhizal networks uh, maintain a forest. Tree in the middle of the forest didn't quite get enough uh, sun, and so uh, they're often connected by mycorrhizal filaments with another tree out here on the edge. It gets a little extra sun, and this this tree contributes to the survival of that tree. In other words, there's more working together, more cooperation, and so that's when our vignettes is when things get tough, pays to cooperate. And of course, the Cold War and all all the attempts now to work together is a sign of that. The globalization uh, means cooperation. If we're going to be global, we have to work together with people and not just fight them and culture. So we have, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> looking at humans now, we have these opposite trends that are, that we don't know what to do about. We have. The globalization that you're talking about in this symposium, but people still want to be separate tribes. So we have tribalization where all the little different religions and all the little different countries want to be their own thing. And they, and they fight, and, and as you know, the worst wars are religious wars because each uh, religion thinks their God is better than your God. And so the Catholics and the Protestants and Muslims and the Christians fight to the death because they think that they, they believe that their God and their way of life is better and therefore we're going to win any war we fight because our God is going to help us, you see. I mean, it's a surprising lot of people, you know, they don't think about that. They believe that and so and so. Okay, two more things. Uh, and this, i just written a little commentary on this and it'll be in the revised part of my book. And this is that humans not only impact the environment, we see a lot of that, but humans have created a new ecosystem that has no parallel in nature. So it may be helpful for us to think of the two houses of man. And I have a little commentary, which will be in the books, is called The Two Houses of of, he, of man. In other words, uh, the new house that man has created, uh, we can use the word which uh, has been suggested by landscape ecologists, particularly Neff, called a techno ecosystem, a city, for example. You see, a city has is a system that has no parallel in nature. The nearest thing in nature, a city might be an oyster reef. You know, where it depends on huge amounts of energy materials being brought to it. So the city requires huge amount of materials and energy to be brought in from outside. In other words, it's a, it's a parasitic thing which requires a support from a, a huge areas of, of land and water and so on. And so it, I think it helps us to uh, think about uh, two s systems and how we might get these two systems to work more mutualistic at the present time they're more or less parasitic. And so and another big difference, of course, between these two systems is the energy source. And this brings out another thing that uh, many ecologists and students completely uh, don't understand, and that is in, and we, have a, we do have a diagram of that, which we can show if necessary, and that is uh, food chains, food webs. In other words, a normal food web you see going from the sun to plants to herbivores to carnivores and so on. And we know that as you go down this food chain, the amount of energy available decreases, so that you have so that you have fewer predators than you would have, than you have herbivores, and, and it, so the predators are scarce. But the other part is, see, this is a good news, bad news story, and so much of what we talk about. Is both positive and negative. Uh, the good, the bad news about the food chain is, if you're going to be a meat eater or a herbivore, you can't have as many of you. And so, if we have too many people in the world, we all have to eat rice or wheat. And uh, uh, people in poor countries can't afford to eat meat and don't usually get enough of it, and so on. 
the human is not a herbivore in that sense because he doesn't have a cecum. He has a little appendix, and he's a meat eater. And by nature, people can be vegetarians, but it's a tr- struggle. And it's not, not any particular advantage to be a vegetarian as far as we know, uh, except avoid poisonous <laughs> it might be in meat, or avoid too much fat or something of that sort. All right, so, so we, have, uh, we have the concept then of the fuel-powered ecosystem. And the thing, uh, see, now the, the thing is that as you go down this food chain, your, your quality of your concentration of energy increases. In other words, as your, as your amount goes down, the quality increases, meaning the energy concentration. In other words, each time you make a change, you lose some of the energy to heat. But what you have left has a higher energy level. In other words, the thing that most people have no concept at all because we don't have any, any um, language or any measures, and that's energy quality. When you talk about energy quality, what do you mean by that? They have no idea what you're talking about. No, it's not all energy is the same, and I don't know why this, can, this is something people can have no uh, concept. We have no terms. We have all kinds of terms for quantity. You know, we have, uh, you know, we have horsepower, calories, joules, everything else, all of which measures how much. And people think that all energy is the same. They think that when we give out of fossil fuels, then all we have to do is use solar power. But solar power is about 2,000 times less dense, less concentrated. Its quality is so low, even though a lot of it, an advantage is you can use it without using up the source. It's renewable. But uh, solar power, sunlight, won't run your car unless you convert it, upgrade it to a higher quality, unless you convert it to electricity or to hydrogen or something of that sort. And so going from fuel-powered, as we run now mostly, fuel-powered system. And so the, the present techno-ecosystem is run by high-quality, non-renewable energy, fuel, oil, gas, and so on. And, of course, we know this is going to run out pretty much this, uh, this millennium, this, this uh, next century, uh, anywhere from 2020 to 2050 it will start going down. And we're already concerned, of course, and we're looking for, this, for alternate sources. And solar power, of course, is one thing we can use, but it's mostly heat. And it'll do for low-quality low, low work like heating homes, but it won't run your car. I mean, you have to convert it either with windmills or with uh, photovoltaic panels and so on. And that that that's very costly. And photoelectric panels are made with some of the most nasty chemicals we have, so we're going to have a lot of pollution resulted in manufacture photovoltaic panels just as we do manufacture plastics with all kinds of endocrine disruptors in those things and so on. So uh, one of the vignettes, of course, is all technology has mixed benefits. There are always good sides. Agricultural technology has increased the amount of food we can grow per acre, but it's put the little farm out of business worldwide. So we have the little farmer no longer can make a living because he didn't can afford all the chemicals and machinery and fuel. And so he goes to the city and becomes a poor person. And so we have the uh, scary growth of the mega cities, St. Paulo, Brazil, and, of course, India, uh, Calcutta, Bombay, all those cities will be the biggest cities very soon. It won't be New York and, and uh, Los Angeles and Tokyo, the biggest cities. Now, the biggest cities very soon, if not already, 25, 30 million people in these places, 90% of which are poor. So that the, you know, the gap between the rich and the poor, which is increased by our present economics, uh, is thing that scares us all away. Okay.